It's Acts 1, 15 to 26, for a sermon I've entitled, Replacing the Traitor. Follow along as I read. So at this time, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren, a gathering of about 120 persons were there together. And he said, Brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David <clears throat> concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was counted among us and received his share in this ministry. Now this man had acquired a field with the price of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all of his intestines gushed out. And it became known to all who were in, living in Jerusalem so that in their land, or in their own language, the field was called Helkadema, the, that is the field of blood. For it is written in the book of the Psalms, let his homestead be made desolate and let no one dwell in it and let another take his office. Therefore, it is necessary of the men who have accompanied us uh, all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they put forward two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all men, show us which of these two you've chosen to occupy this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they drew lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. You know, preparing my sermon today, I came across an article from the 24-7 Tempo website by John Harrington. It was entitled, The Most Famous Traitors in History. Now, some of the people on the list I was familiar with, Marcus Brutus, he was a close friend of Julius Caesar who led 60 senators to stab Caesar to death. It was reported that as he did, Brutus turned, or Caesar turned to Brutus and said, you too, my child? Or how about Matahari? She was a Dutch woman who passed herself off as an exotic Indian uh, dancer. Later when she became an escort, she was recruited by one of her wealthy uh, French customers to seduce a German officer with the hope of gaining information to help the war effort. But Matahari acted as a double agent and eventually she was arrested and found guilty. As she was standing before her firing squad, she blew kisses to the soldiers who were about to shoot her. Vidkum Quisling, you ever heard that name? He was a Norwegian politician who collaborated with the Nazis when the Germans occupied Norway in World War II. The word quizzling is found in the Oxford Dictionary. The definition next to it just simply says traitor. Now the name that's synonymous for traitor in our country though is Benedict Arnold. He was an American-born officer who fought on the side of the colonists against the British. He was one of General Washington's most trusted commanders until he defected and went over to the other side. Others on the list include Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. They were American spies who worked for the Soviet Union, providing the Russians with information that led to the development of the hydrogen bomb. But you know, on that list, perhaps the most despicable person I came across was Stella Kubler. She worked for the Gestapo, providing information that led to the arrest and the death of 3,000 Jews. But what made her actions even more treacherous was the fact that Stella herself was Jewish. Born Stella Goldschlag, she was raised in Berlin, Germany as an only child. And though her parents were concerned about the growing anti-Semitism that they saw going on in Germany, uh, they thought it was just another round of Jew hatred. But then Kristallnacht happened, the night of the crystal, as it's called, where they broke into Jewish shops and smashed them and burned synagogues. And they realized at that time that they had to leave the country, but the problem was it was too late. The Jews were already being rounded up and shipped off to labor camp. Now, the Goldschlags managed to continue to live in the city and to move about freely because Stella and her mom were both blonde-haired and blue-eyed, and they looked more Aryan than they did Jewish. But eventually, Stella was sent off to a forced labor camp. There she met her husband, Manfred Kubler. When the Germans uh, started to send workers from the factory to the death camps, the couple managed to escape using uh, forged IDs. Well, in the spring of 1943, though, Stella was arrested by the Nazis and taken to a woman's prison where she was interrogated and tortured. She managed to escape briefly during a dental visit, but then she was rearrested and when she showed up at her parents' house, which was being watched by the Gestapo, she was sent back to the women's prison. But strangely enough, on October 24, 1943, the prison was bombed 
And when it was, uh, the, uh, her cell was damaged and she was able to escape again. But this time she went right back to where her parents were being held um, in detention because she thought she would probably die with them. But it was at that point that she decided to make a deal with the Gestapo. And she agreed to become a catcher, hunting down Jews, hiding as non-Jews in Berlin. The Gestapo promised her that if she collaborated, that neither she nor her parents would be deported and she would be given 3,000 Reich marks for each Jew she betrayed. Well, Stella got to work contacting family members and friends, luring them in with promises of food and money and offers of help. Afterwards, she would rat them out to the authorities. Now, because of her vivacious personality and her good looks, the Nazi overlords dubbed her the Blonde Poison. Now, to be a victim of crime is bad enough, but when the person who commits the crime against you is one of your trusted friends, that makes it even worse. That brings it to a whole nother level of evil. Well, there are many despicable and notorious traitors in history, but without a doubt, the worst was Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus. For in the truest sense, Judas is the only person who's ever betrayed an innocent man. Well, in this portion of Acts, we have the account of the apostles choosing the replacement for the traitor, Judas. And so today what I want to do is I'd like to take a look at what the Gospels have to say about Judas, consider the role that he played in God's plan of salvation, and then see how the apostles went about replacing him uh, by another man. So let's pray and ask for God to give us the grace. Father God, I pray for grace and mercy that you help us as we look at your word, that we may apply it to our hearts and find joy as a result of it. Bless us now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, so the first question we need to ask is simply this. Who is Judas? Who is Judas? What do we know of him from the gospel accounts? Well, he's referred to as Judas Iscariot, and that's helpful because there's another of other Judases in the Bible. There's Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, who wrote the small epistle found near the end of the gospel. There's also another apostle named Judas, sometimes known as Judas, not Iscariot. He also went by the name Thaddeus. Well, scholars are not certain why the name Iscariot is applied to Judas, something that is um, taken from the Latin word Sicarius, which means dagger man. The Sicarii were a group of Jewish terrorists that assassinated people by stabbing them to death. Did Judas have a shady background like Simon the Zealot, who had belonged to another terrorist group? Well, perhaps. The Iscariot might also come from the Hebrew, which means man of Kiriath. Kiriath was a town in Israel. In John 6, 30, uh, 71, he's referred to as Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. So it seems more likely that that's the explanation. Now, a disciple is a follower or a learner uh, of a teacher, and Jesus had quite a number of disciples during his ministry. Indeed, on one occasion, we're told that he sent out 70 two by two. But from among this larger group, he chose 12 to be with him on a more constant basis, and one of the 12 was Judas Iscariot. Now, you might think to yourself, you know, if Jesus knew what Judas would turn out to be, he never would have picked him. But that's not actually the case. In John chapter 6, after telling the disciples that he was the bread of life and that they needed to eat his body and drink his blood if they wanted eternal life, a number of his followers became offended. They said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, conscious of their, his disciples grumbling at this point, said, does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It's the Spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some here who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who it was who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, For this reason I said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by the Father. John 6, 60-65. Jesus knew who were the true believers and those who were merely pretending. And he knew that when he chose Judas, he would later betray him. Indeed, that's why he chose Judas. But here's a question. Did the other disciples know that he was a false brother? No. When Jesus sent out the twelve to cast out demons and to heal people and to preach the gospel, Judas went out with them. He preached the gospel of the kingdom. He performed miraculous signs. Those things are still not evidence of true faith. Remember what Jesus said? He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father will enter the kingdom. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name 
and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You can even do miracles, ultimately through the power of God, and yet yourself not be born again. There's pastors and evangelists who convert hundreds, even thousands of people to Christ who are going to end up in hell themselves because they didn't actually believe the gospel that they preached. You know, though, almost any time you watch Hollywood do a movie about Jesus, when they come to the character of Judas, they always paint him as a sympathetic figure, or at least a tragic one. One of the movies I remember seeing you know, portrayed the motivation for Jesus being portrayed by, or betrayed by Judas as Judas wanting to, to kind of rush Jesus along to overthrow the Romans so that the kingdom of God could be established. But you know, when you read through the New Testament, there's only one reason ever given for Judas betraying Jesus. It's just one of simple greed. Do you remember what pushed him over the edge? Jesus was at the house of a man named Simon, who was a leper. And we read this, Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. But Judas is scared. One of the disciples who was intending to betray him said, why, why was this perfume not so sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor people? Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And since he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was in it. Therefore Jesus said, let her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. In Matthew's account, right after this happened, we read, Then one of the twelve, named Judas Iscariot, went out to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me to betray him to you? And they weighed out from thirty pieces of silver. From then on, he began looking for a good opportunity to betray Jesus. And you're familiar with the story. It was at Passover. Jesus announced to his disciples that one of them would betray him. And they were all stunned and they were deeply grieved, it says in the text. And each one began to ask, saying, Surely not I, Lord. And then when he came to Judas, Judas said with a wry smile, It's not me, Lord. Surely not I. Peter wanted to know who it was, so he whispered to John to ask Jesus about it. And Jesus told them, he said, It's the one that I dipped the morsel in and hand to. This is the one who will betray me. Then he offered it to Judas. John tells us, After the morsel, Satan entered into him, meaning Judas. Therefore, Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. Now, no one there reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said it to him. For some were supposing, because Jesus had the money box, that Jesus was saying to him, buy the things that we need for the feast, or else that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel, he went out. Listen to John's line. And immediately, it was night. Judas found the high priest and informed him where he could find Jesus to arrest him, take him away. And then later he led the authorities and their goon squad to the Garden of Gethsemane where he was praying. Judas walked up to Jesus and kissed him and said, Rabbi. And Jesus said, Are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? By the way, that's where they get that phrase, kiss of death, from. Now all this is background information to help us understand our text this morning. Jesus had gone back to heaven. The disciples were gathered together, praying and waiting for the arrival of the Holy Spirit, but they faced a problem. Jesus had appointed 12 apostles, and they were down to 11, and they felt they needed to rectify the situation. That brings us to our next question. What role did he play? Look at what it says in verse 15. At that time, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren, a gathering of about 120 persons were there together, and said, Brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was counted among us and received his share in the ministry. Now, everyone involved in the arrest and crucifixion of Jesus played their part as scripted out by God. This was all, that this was all scripted out by God is proved by Acts 4, 27 to 28. Look over to that, that passage, just a couple pages over. Acts 4, 27 to 28. Here we have the disciples after they've been arrested and beaten and let go, and they're reflecting upon their experience and how this was really a fulfillment of Scripture. But look at what it says down in 27. As they're, as they're praying to God, it says, For truly in this city there was gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, listen to what it says, to do what your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. The part scripted by God for Judas 
was to play, play the betrayer and the traitor. Now let me ask you a question. I want you to think about this. Could Judas have decided not to betray Jesus? The answer is no. Speaking of his upcoming betrayal by Judas, Jesus said this, The Son of Man will go just as it is written of him, but woe to the, that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Now, if Judas had changed his mind and decided not to go through with his dastardly deed, then Jesus wouldn't have been betrayed and the scripture would have proven false that prophesied that it would happen this way. So Judas had to betray Jesus, just like Pilate had to condemn him to die. But if God predestined, predetermined that this would occur, does that mean that Judas had no choice? No, it doesn't. Judas did what he wanted to do. He sold out his master for 30 pieces of silver. But God is sovereign over everything, including Judas' choices. So he fulfilled the eternal purpose of God. To paraphrase the words of Joseph, Judas meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So in your Bible, you probably have the next two verses in parenthesis. Look down, do you have it? Is it written in parenthesis? That's because the, they want you to understand that these aren't actually Peter's words, the next two verses. Rather, it's an editorial comment given as background information by Luke. Luke informs his readers by saying this, Now this man, meaning Judas, acquired a field with the price of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle of his, and his intestines gushed out. Oh, that's gross. And it became known to all who were living in Jerusalem so that the, in their own language, the field was called Helka uh, Dama, which means the field of blood. Now, critics of the Bible jump on the scripture at this point, claiming that they give contradictory accounts as to how Jesus, or Judas died. In Matthew's account, we're told that after Jesus was sentenced to death, Judas was just racked by guilt and he went back to the religious leaders and he tried to return the money. And they said, no, it's, <laughs> that's for you to worry about. So he took the money and he threw it in the temple complex and he went out and he hung himself. Well, which did he do? Did he hang himself or did he throw himself off of a pinnacle and burst his guts open? Well, Augustine speculated that what Judas did was he hung himself, but the rope broke. Or perhaps he hung himself and they didn't find his body for a week or so, and by that time in the hot sun, he had bloated so that when they cut him down, he splattered. Well, after Judas threw the money in the temple complex, the priest decided that it was blood money, so, I mean, that would defile it if they put it in the temple treasury. I mean, you wouldn't want to defile it with dirty money. So what did they do? They decided to launder it by uh, buying a field. We're told this, then, uh, so they decided to, to buy a potter's field and to use it for burial ground for strangers. Matthew says that this, uh, this, then this was, uh, was spoken, which through the uh, prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled, that they took 30 pieces of silver and the price of one who had uh, been set by the sons of Israel, and they gave them for a potter's field as the Lord directed me. And the locals referred to the cemetery as the field of blood. Now Peter says in verse 17 here, that Judas was counted among us and received his share in the ministry. And then he quotes a verse from Psalm 69. In that psalm, David pleads with God to rescue him and to bring destruction upon those who are persecuting him. But then when you read through the psalm, you'll find that it's actually a messianic psalm that points forward ultimately to Jesus. David wrote this, he wrote, Reproach has broken my heart. I'm so sick. I looked for sympathy but, sympathy, sympathy, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. Listen to this. Then they also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. That last line was fulfilled as a prophecy when Jesus, when he was hanging on the cross, and he cried out, I thirst, and they gave him sour wine, vinegar to drink. And then verse 24 of that psalm, it says this, Pour out your indignation on them, and may your burning wrath overtake them. And then the next verse after that, the one that Peter quotes says this, Let his homestead be made desolate, and let no one dwell in it. Now David wanted God to deal with his enemies. Now Peter quoting this verse is telling us that God has dealt with Christ's enemy, specifically the betrayer Judas. But now that Judas has been removed by God, what are the apostles supposed to do? I mean, Jesus appointed 12 apostles. Now there were only 11. Well, Peter takes a cue from Psalm 109. In this psalm, we find David again calling on God to smite those who betrayed him. It opens up with these words. It says, O God of my praise, do not be silent, for they have opened their wicked and deceitful mouths against me. They have spoken against me with lying tongue. They have surrounded me with words of hatred. They have fought against me without a cause. In turn, for my love, they act as my accusers. But I am in prayer. 
Thus they have repaid me evil for good and hatred for love. Now those words certainly fit Jesus' experience in regard to Judas. I mean, Judas opened his wicked and deceitful mouth against Jesus. He fought against Jesus without a just cause. Jesus showed him nothing but love, and yet he became his accuser and his betrayer, repaying evil for good and hatred for love. Judas was a wicked and despicable man. But David goes on in that psalm to say of this betrayer, when he's judged, let him come forth guilty, and let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few. Let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. From that, Peter draws the conclusion that the office of Judas, the traitor, should be taken by another, fulfilled by someone else. And that brings us to our last question. How do they go about replacing him? Peter goes on to say in verse 21, look what it says, Therefore, it was necessary that the men of the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. Do you remember when the rich young ruler came to Jesus asking what he must he do to obtain eternal life? Notice he wants to do something. Jesus said, well, then keep the commandments. Then he said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not uh, murder. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, well, all these things I've kept from my youth. What am I still lacking? Really? You've kept all these commandments? From the time you were a kid? You never disobeyed your father once. You never sassed your mom. You never lied to anyone. You never stole anything, no matter how small. You've never had a sexual thought about someone who wasn't your spouse. Whether he knew it or not, he, like the rest of us, had violated God's commandments many, many times. He needed a savior. So Jesus said to him, If you wish to be complete, Go and sell all your possessions and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and then come follow me. What's the first commandment? You shall have no other gods before me. He's talking about how he kept all the commandments. He hadn't even kept the first one as evidenced by his response. He said, but when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. It was after that that Peter said, behold, we've left everything to follow you. What will there then be for us? And Jesus said, Truly I say to you who have followed me, that in the regeneration when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left father or uh, houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for my sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first now will be last and those who are last will be first. Now notice Jesus said that when he sits on his glorious throne, that these 12 will be sitting, or the, the, there will be 12 sitting on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, there's 12 thrones awaiting the apostles, but the problem is they only have 11 apostles. So they have to replace one. Now I want you to notice the qualifications that were necessary in order for them to be a, a replacement. Peter says that it has to be somebody who had been with them from the very beginning of John's baptism of Jesus and had gone with Jesus along the path. Second thing, it had to be somebody who had been an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ because they were going to be witnesses, martyrs, witnesses for the resurrection. By the way, I have to say something here. There are religious groups that claim that their leaders are in line with the original 12 apostles. The Mormon church has 12 leaders that they claim are apostles, each of whom function, quote, also as prophets, seers, and revelators who hold the keys of the priesthood, the right of the presidency, and, on the power, and have the, or the power to give, given to a man by God to direct, control, and govern God's priesthood on earth. The Roman Catholic Church claims that the popes are the successors of the apostles, specifically Peter, who they consider to be the first pope. And so the popes today speak with the same authority as the apostles spoke. There's a group of charismatic leaders who call themselves the New Apostolic Reformation. They claim that they're modern-day apostles who are to be over the church. And then as the church unites behind them, God will begin to empower them to do miracles. But all these people that are put forward apostles, as apostles, according to Peter, wouldn't be qualified to be successors because none of them was part of Jesus' earthly ministry and none of them have seen the resurrected Christ. Listen carefully, there are no successors to the apostles. And it was Judas's defection rather than his death that caused them to appoint a replacement. I mean, think about it. when James died, did they replace him? No. 
Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building is being fitted together, is growing into a holy temple of the Lord, in whom also you are being built up together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. There are no successors to the apostles. The apostles, along with the prophets, are the foundation of the church because they're the ones who gave us the Scripture. And so the calling of a pastor is to faithfully teach and preach the truth that was revealed to the prophets and the apostles through the Holy Spirit. But Paul tells us that the Scripture is God-breathed. These people making these claims are just blowing a lot of hot air. They're spiritual windbags. Well, having put forth the qualifications, what do they do next? Look at what it says in verse 23. They put forward two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, who is also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all men, show us which of these two you have chosen to occupy this ministry and apostleship, which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they drew lots for them. That's kind of like throwing dice. And the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. Now, some have suggested that the church was making a mistake here, that God actually intended for uh, Paul to be the twelfth apostle, and that the church had gotten out ahead of themselves. But I, I don't think that's actually the case. Paul was an apostle, but of a special kind. He was not one who had been with them since the time that uh, Jesus had gone in and out. He had not been there since the baptism. So he was in a different class, and there are others that are called apostles that were not part of the Twelve. No, Judas lost his life and his office as apostle because he betrayed Jesus. And God had actually chosen Matthias to replace him. Now, it's interesting because Matthias is not mentioned nowhere else in the Scripture but here. And yet, uh, obviously, he took part of the ministry that other apostles have. So what, what should we make for application of this transition period here? Well, let's give you three. Here's the first thing. God is sovereign over all things, including the choices and actions of wicked men. The Bible says that he works all things after the counsel of his own will. And though the world looks like it's spinning out of control sometimes, and though your life seems like it may be heading in who knows what direction, it's still all in the hands of God. And if you're a believer, you're in the hands of God. And so you can trust him in the midst of all of it. The second lesson I think we can draw from this is this. God determines everything from the betrayal of Jesus by Judas to how the lots would fall so that Matthias was chosen rather than Joseph. And yet, we are all accountable for the choices that we make. Judas betrayed Jesus because he wanted to. And for that sin, and all of his others, he's going to be punished forever in hell. Here's the third thing, though. There may be temporary setbacks for the witnesses of Christ, but the gospel is still going to go forward and the elect will all eventually be called in. Peter denied Jesus but later repented. Why? Because Jesus had prayed for him. Why? because he was among the elect. Judas betrayed Jesus and then went out and hung himself. Jesus never prayed for him. Why? Because Judas was not among the elect. Stella Kubler. You know, she did this. It's, it's funny, when I read some of the articles about her, some of them were sympathetic because she had been tortured and they said, you know, she gave in under pressure. But uh, she did this with the hope of saving her life and the life of her parents. But you know, when it was all said and done, they sent her parents off to the gas chambers anyway. And Stella ended up serving 10 years in prison. And then when she got out, she committed suicide. A disgraced betrayer, just like Judas. I think John Gerstner was right when he said, you know what the definition of a tragedy is? Anything that happens to the non-elect. In the midst of all these things, in the midst of all the things we see going on in our world, in our country, all the corruption, not knowing what the future is going to bring even the next couple of years, God is still in control of the whole situation. He's in control of the things of your life, and there's nothing that's going to come into your life that wasn't signed off by him for your good and for his son's glory. We can trust him no matter what happens because he's a trustworthy God. Let's pray. Our Father in God, you know, this was just one small thing that they needed to do before the coming of the Spirit. But it had to be done. 
and they did it, putting forward a couple of men and asking you to choose for them. We know that you ultimately are the ones who chooses who will be pastors and who won't be pastors, or in ultimately even who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved. But in the midst of that, we can trust you, that we can pray and ask you for help and to intervene, and if it's according to your will, you will do just that, and you'll bring us great joy in the midst of it. So, fathers, we're facing all kinds of things that are fearful to us, things that we're concerned about. I pray that we would trust you, that we would look to you and we would count on the fact that you're a sovereign God who's in control of all things. Because where else are we going to look? There's nobody else who can control the future. But you have determined it all. So bless us now as we uh, try to serve you in ways that please you. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.